Hey there everybody, this is the Mighty Clues Tick for the AJ channel, bringing you detailed information on monsters and locations, cosmic forces, magic and mayhem for the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. Today we're going to take a close, but not too close, look at the evil alien pan-dimensional slavers and merchants, the Neogi. The, and this is a perfect opportunity to talk to you, introduce many of you to Spelljammer. So this is a kind of a lead-in to the uh, a lead-in video on that subject. After all, I have mentioned that the Mind Flayers had both an interdimensional as well as an interstellar empire. Dungeons and Dragons has had spaceships and aliens since, oh, Expedition to the Barrier Peaks in 1976, or more officially in 1980. Aside from Bolo's Guide to Monsters, which gives the updated 5th edition version of the Neo Gear on page 179, we also have an excellent ecology article in Dragon Magazine 427 from September in 2013, written by Jeff Morganroth, which I will be drawing from heavily. The artwork by Christopher Burdett is simply superb. I'll put a link to his website in the doobly-doo. I also delved into Planescape, where I discovered an extra planet cousin to the Neogi, the So, who roamed the lawful um, outer planes, avoiding the lawful good ones, though. And they're very similar to Neogi, um, but they're slightly less vicious amongst themselves, but otherwise pretty much the same, just more lawful. Neogi are aberrations. They are creepy on many levels, not least of which is that they look like a giant spider, ma spider mated with an eel and a vicious goblin. If you would like to know what they sound like speaking their own language, we have a perfect example in the voice of Poggle the Lesser, a Geonosian from Star Wars. However, when not speaking their native language, they are very smooth talkers, deceptively so. Inside their minds, they are alien horrors from the Far Realm, craving flesh and the subjugation of all others, but they can portray a veneer of fairness and reason. Typically, when negotiating a trade deal, they're amiable, patient, and anticipate the decisions of whomever they're dealing with. This amazing ability to beguile and know how to deal with other species is because Neogi have a potent psychic power of telepathy. They know what to say because they can read the thoughts of those around them with superb skill and stealth. Neogi are evil to the core. If one considers a definition of evil to be the depriving of others of their freedom, then Neogi are poster children of evil. But before we get into the psychology of these creatures, let's talk about their ecology. But first, a note on their natural habitat, which is to say, they don't have one. Legend tells that the Mind Flayers discovered a singular creature and mutated it, creating the first Neogi as a potential biological agent, a stealthy means to control and enslave other species for the Great Illithid Empire. But the Neogi progenitor proved to be far more adaptive, intelligent, and psychotic than even the Mind Flayers were prepared for, and it escaped to the far-flung world. Seething with hatred for the Mind Flayers, and nearing its end, it spontaneously sacrificed itself to create the first Neogi brood. And they, in turn, create more broods, growing and building strong, and building their own technology and culture. But at some point in the distant past, this Neogi homeworld was completely overrun and torn apart, processed and used to continue the relentless expansion of the mechanical life forms called Clockwork Horrors, which I'll do another video on shortly. They don't feel too, feel, uh, feel too sad for the Neogi. They had landed on a planet lost to these robots long ago looking for slaves, and in the process lost their lives and the secret to travel between the crystal spheres to the Clockwork Horrors, which the Clockwork Horrors reconstructed and assimilated this technology, heading straight to the Neogi homeworld as their first target. So Neogi struck their greedy claws into a hornet's nest and got badly stung, and now they roam the cosmos homeless. But, on the world of Faerun, they are found almost exclusively deep in the Underdark. So, starting with the reproductive method, which is violent and creepy and gruesome, let's have a look at that. Neogi are asexual. They have the potential to become a host to a new brood, but do not do so intentionally. Reproduction is a vicious act of gang violence for their species, where a single Neogi becomes too old and insane to, to control its slaves anymore. The other Neogi raise up as one against it and sting it again and again with their poisons. The differing poisons moving through its body overload the old Neogi system and it begins to change into a great old master. 
The Nyogi making the transformation into Great Old Master swells to 20 feet in height and a similar girth. Its legs and arms become useless and its intelligence fades. It now lives only to eat. It's consumed by pain. Live flesh is preferred, but the dead will sustain it. And a Great Old Master inflicts 1d12 points of damage per round to any creature it is uh, fed quite nasty after two months of eating the skin of the great old master bursts and a new crop of mature neogi spill out these are unmarked and barely sentient at birth and for the next week the brood surrounds and res um, resounds with combat as the young neogi kill each other for food of the 20 to 40 neogi that eat their way out of the parent only about three to six of them survive so it's absolute slaughter they are considered slaves of the community until such time as they claim an underhulk as their personal slave. Now just a, a note on the form of the Neogi when they um, emerge from the Great Old Master. They are aberrations and they're not completely homogenous as a species. So there's a lot of uh, personal variation between them. Um, this is reflected in the artwork that you see of Neogi that some of them have more spider-like legs, some of them have more fleshy legs, some of them have articulated human-like hands, some of them barely have claws that can manipulate things. So some of them look quite different to the others, and this is normal and accepted amongst Neogi. To a Neogi, everything in the universe is either owned or owner, slave or master, and only Neogi can be masters. Even Neogis are slaves to other Neogis forming a hierarchy within their society, but even their slave Neogis may have their own slaves and may eventually become the masters themselves. For all their viciousness, the Neogis would not be such a threat except for their relationship with Umberhulks. The Neogis raise them from birth, training the monsters to follow the small lords and care for their every need. Every Neogi has at least one primary Umberhulk called a Lord Servant and usually many other lesser servants. To the Neogis, all other species are desirable displays, but none of them will ever be as valued and highly, uh, highly prized as the least of their Umberhulks. Neogis gather slaves for many purposes, including expendable troops in battle, laborers, playthings to be tortured, and of course, eventually, food. Trust me, every Neogi who has spent enough time around humans to learn how to speak common has eaten more than one human. Part of the reason they so frequently keep human slaves is they find them both easy to manipulate, you know, minds are just wide open, and very tasty, though perhaps not quite as delicious as a nice plump halfling. It's just something of a delicacy. Mm. Very nice. Wherever they are known, they are almost universally hated. Even among what we would call the evil races, the Neogi are at best never trusted and otherwise often killed on sight for simple, or just simply avoided if possible. If their ships are encountered in space, it's best to either attack them immediately or flee immediately, depending on whether or not you think you can take them. If a Nogi is out in public, they will be well protected at all times with a retinue of slave guards and, of course, at least one Umberhulk lurking around. The Neogis, they probably are riding it, actually. The Neogis are a surprisingly small race to inspire such hate and fear. They're only about three feet high at the body. Um, from claw to the top of the abdomen, they have the body of a giant spidey, spider with a neck and head of a moray eel that reaches up um, higher to about eye level with a, a human. The body is furry with eight legs that usually appear very much like a spider legs, but they're actually much more fleshy and flexible with complex joints. The bristles that grow from the abdomen are about one to three inches long and are more like porcupine quills than hair. They're hard. They're usually a shade of brown and the Neogi can move them with muscle control. So they can correspond their movements to the mood of the Neogi and project their feelings, send coded signals to slaves and have the Neogi, or even create pictures, hypnotic patterns and complex hairstyles depending on their status. Typically they're coloured with dyes as the Neogi acquires more status and wealth, so the more garishly decorated a Neogi will be, um, it, it may be the master of its brood, so you should be, be wary. Their evil, vicious face is filled with needle-like sharp teeth. Their bite is poisonous, acting as a paralyzing venom on most humanoids. It sickens them, makes them ill. Though they prefer to have slaves do the fighting for them, a Neogi is weirdly strong for something so small, at least as strong as a grown human male. They just don't exercise that strength um, very often. They can grapple a human being with relative ease and deliver tearing, savage bites, as well as a virulent injection of venom. 
They may also carry a weapon such as a magic dagger or a short sword for personal protection and utility. Executing slaves, for instance. They are all, to the last member of their race, killers, plunderers, slavers and sadists. While extremely cautious, they're not cowardly. They fight using a psychic ability to cause pain and discomfort, but it seems to be limited to their line of sight um, for the most part, unless you're enslaved by them, in which case it can be a uh, radius of up to a mile. Neogi Mind Control is by far the most potent and fearsome weapon. Even Drow and Mind Flayers are wary of it. It is hard to resist, and the victims will not realize that they've been mentally dominated. That's the most insidious part, because they will think that the instructions are coming from their own thoughts. The Neogi effectively infiltrates and matches the signals that the brain produces, so they can invoke feelings of euphoria, pain, cravings, and make a victim believe that they, uh, what they're compelled to do was actually their own idea in the first place. Those who attempt to resist find it very hard to do so, as they're as much confused about what are their own thoughts and what are the orders from the Neogi master, so it may seem like they're trying to resist their own impulses. Also, they must fight off rewards and punishments that flood them with overwhelming pain or pleasure. After a relatively short per period of control, the slave will essentially be hopelessly addicted to the Neogi psionic highs, um, and this may be um, a, a source of unrelenting psychological trauma to an ex-slave of Neogi, never quite getting over the fact that they loved serving the Neogi and hated them at the same time. In Spelljammer, the Neogi travel through the Sea of Night, between the crystal realm spheres using a large spider-shaped ships that uh, require magic for propulsion. They also have access to starry compasses, or magical devices that, when properly installed, can allow a normal seafaring craft from Toril to lift out of the water and rise through the sky and into the Sea of the Night. Uh, space is different in Dungeons and Dragons. The complicated language of the Neogi is called K'askjik'n. They speak it among themselves, and sometimes other far realm races, such as the Grell, actually understand it. But have the Neogi have almost zero tolerance for humanoids trying to talk to them in their own language, as mispronunciations are all too easy, and even minor mistakes can change meanings considerably, which will make a Neogi furious. Neogi will almost never offer to teach any other race their language, so I would suggest just either using magical assistance or don't try it at all. The Neogi have a weird attitude towards their religion. They don't offer prayers and rarely make sacrifices, but instead demand favours and boons from their deities regularly. They don't see them as gods, they see them as um, spiritual over-servants. Seeing them as um, servitors, really, who owe their existence to the Neogi. The Neogi powers are also asexual, just like the Neogi themselves. Speaking the name of one of their deities incorrectly is the worst form of sacrilege and will earn you a slow and painful death by the Neogi. The Neogi pantheon includes, and forgive me Neogi if I get this wrong, Kajzilk, a dead god of creation, Kilkix, a chaotic evil lesser god of death, murder and poison, Kristix, a chaotic evil god, lesser god of war, brutality and strength, Pekir, a lawful easy, evil lesser god of fear and tyranny. Trick e, a neutral evil, evil god of love, which is actually more like envy and jealousy in human terms. You know, you do, don't really understand love. And Tzink il, a ne neutral evil lesser god of torture, pain and suffering. Neogi psychology is a study in complete narcissism and pretty functional state of perpetual psychosis. Neogi constantly crave dominance and control. They identify acquisition of wealth and power as the only measure of self-worth. But as soon as they have something, they immediately crave the next thing. More is never enough. Enough is a term that only applies to how much f f fresh flesh they can stuff into their more, or how much they have traded to get what they desire, until such time as they can take back whatever they've traded. Because once the thing is theirs, it's never anyone else's. It's just a temporarily in another's possession, like a loan the other one was not aware that they signed up to. Anyone or anything that stands in the way of what a Neogi wants to acquire is viewed with roiling, cold and furious hatred. The moment another being is encountered, the Neogi seeks to own it and everything it has. Interestingly, the slaves of Neogi make their own slaves and have their own possessions, though these possessions are still technically owned by its master. 
In this way, there is a hierarchy to any Niyogi brood and their slaves. All of them, except the dominant Niyogi, are slaves to the next most dominant Niyogi. The pecking order of ownership is how they decide anything, including the most tense decisions, such as how to divvy up the loot for, from a slaughtered victim. Niyogi are tactical and strategic. They will avoid killing anyone who has a direct use to them, but they also have a sadistic and hedonistic habit of torturing and murdering their slaves, then eating them. Thanks to the unique psychology and perverse mentality of the Niyogi, they are impossible to put to sleep using magic and have advantage against all forms of charm or fear effects. If you want to spice up your Niyogi, your Niyogi I highly recommend reskinning some wondrous items and give them an exotic otherworldly technology feel. Uh, plus, don't feel afraid to give them a few ray guns. These might fall into the player's hands, but only you, the DM, know how many charges the thing has left. And perhaps if they don't remove the crystal magazine quickly by unscrewing it counterclockwise when it makes a chirping sound, it renders the weapon useless. You can borrow that from uh, Paranoia. Excellent role-playing game. That should preserve your game balance quite nicely. So, Spelljammer. What is the basic idea in a nutshell? Uh, that's it for Neogi, by the way. Horrible things. <clears throat> Spelljammer was introduced into the AD&D universe, a, a comprehensive system of fantasy astrophysics, including the Ptolemaic, uh, concept, Ptolemaic concept of crystal spheres. The crystal spheres may contain multiple worlds and are navigatable using ships equipped with spelljamming helms. Ships powered by spelljamming helms are capable of flying not, into the, not only into the sky of your world, but also into space, with their own fields of gravity and atmosphere. The ships have open decks and tend not to resemble the spaceships of science fiction, but instead more like galleons, animals, birds, fish, or even more weirdly fantastical shapes, like the Nautilus ships of the Mind Flayers. The Spelljammer setting is designed to allow the usual sword and sorcery adventures of Dungeons & Dragons to take place in the framework of outer space tropes. Flying ships travel through the vast expanses of interplanetary space, visiting moons and planets and other stellar objects. Like the Planescape setting, Spelljammer unifies most of the other AD&D settings and provides a canonical method for allowing characters from one setting, such as Dragonlance, to travel to another, such as the Forgotten Realms. However, unlike Planescape, it keeps all of the action on the Prime Material Plane and uses the Crystal Spheres so it doesn't go off into the Outer Planes or the Astral Sea or whatever, and the Phlogiston between them to uh, form natural barriers between otherwise uh, incompatible settings. Though the cosmology is derived largely from the Ptolemaic system of astronomy, many of the ideas owe much to the works of Jules Verne and his contemporaries and to related games and fiction from steampunk um, and the planetary romance flavour and the, the idea of it being a Dungeons and Dragons Age of Sail on a cosmic scale. Obviously, this is not space as we know it, and it has its own laws, such as how objects are surrounded by a bubble of air that um, lasts for three months or so before it goes stale. Route, routes between the spheres is determined by the flow of a mysterious element called phlogiston, and the whole setting itself is named after a single massive and majestic ship, a mythical one called the Spelljammer. So yeah, there you go. More on Spelljammer as I uncover it um, through exploring other species and elements of the game. If you want to hear more about Spelljammer, let me know in the comment section down below. And I'll catch you again very soon, everyone.